James gives a strong reprimand to the wealthy for their oppression of those persons who are discouraged by the reality of poverty. However, in verses 7 through 12, James offers a brief survival guide for those persons who are discouraged while waiting on the Lord's return. In a very real sense, this survival guide, in essence, states that this too shall pass away. James wanted the poor, the oppressed, downtrodden, the disillusioned, and the discouraged to know that God's will for them as they agonized and as they suffered under the boot of those persons who were insensitive, uninterested, and unattached to the plight of those persons who are less fortunate than ourselves is that there's a God somewhere Amen. who is on our side. I call this lesson very simply a word for the description. I do so because our lesson serves as a powerful reminder to those of us who are discouraged of the fact that even though there are some persons who are seemingly unaffected by our plight in life, God has a word of encouragement for us. Many, there are several profound insights we can discover from our lesson. Let me share with you briefly in passing this morning three insights. I hope that they will strengthen our faith, deepen our commitment, make our walk with the Lord prove to be more relevant to our everyday lives. First place, first things that we can discover from our lesson is the fact that in order for us to overcome discouragement in our lives, we must be determined not to lose our perspective. Verse 8 of our lesson, James admonishes us to stand firm. And he goes on to highlight for us one of the main reasons why so many of us so easily get discouraged in our lives. Verse 8, James says, be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Unfortunately, this is the dimension of our situation. Far too many of us miss in our lives. No matter what happens, God is coming. God is coming sooner than many of us think. The perspective that we must strive to have in the midst of our suffering is that God has promised to come. God has promised to rescue and deliver us. God has come to set us free. No matter how long it takes. Earlier on, the word of God in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, provides for us examples of the kind of folk we should make it our business to surround ourselves with when we are up against it in our lives. Because these individuals are victorious because they never lost their perspective. Right of the book of Hebrews makes mention of the fact that we who are believers are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Witnesses referred to and that are listed in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews are no less than 10 feet of faith that are cataloged in order to help us as we run this race of life. According to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, these heroes of our faith have shut the mouths of hungry lions, become mighty warriors, seen the dead raised, offered sacrifices to the Lord, walked by faith and not by sight, given birth to great nations, traveled through deadly territories, were whipped, stoned, chained, bound in prison, left destitute, sawed into, persecuted, missed, treated and put to death by the sword. And yet, in spite of all that they went through, they kept the faith, yeah. ran the race, and they yeah. finished their course. The reason why they were able to endure, the things that they were able to endure was because they possessed the right perspective on their lives. 
These are the kind of individuals we should seek to surround ourselves with, especially when we are discouraged. We need to make it our business to surround ourselves with individuals who have been through the storms of life. And even though they have been through the storms of life and emerged scarred, they are still hopeful, beaten but not defeated, shaken but still on solid ground. Marred but still useful, hated but still having love, under distress but still filled with blessed assurance, pressed down but always rising, out of options but still exercising confidence in God. Earthly victors and heavenly victors both serve as a wonderful source of encouragement as we run the race in life that God has specifically designed for us. Tragically, many of the people of God become impatient, become aggravated, become agitated, and sometimes disgusted. Moreover, in many instances, our condition can be attributed to the fact that instead of surrounding ourselves with encouragers, we have surrounded ourselves with people who are discouraging, who are pessimistic, and sometimes filled with negativity. Folks with a negative spirit will tear us down. A negative spirit is a bitter spirit. A negative spirit is a sour heart. And in many instances, these persons are envious, jealous, they're covetous, they're egotistical, and they're narcissistic. We are to patiently wait on the Lord that it behooves us to hold on. One of the things that helps us to stay encouraged is to think about the goodness of the Lord. Think about the times when God made a way for us when there was no way. Think about the times when we prayed our way through what we could not, when we could not think our way through. Think about the times when we were down but God turned us around. Think about the times when the Lord renewed our strength, renewed our hope, rekindled our fire, healed our bodies, liberated our to do whatever it takes to remain encouraged, to remain inspired, and to hold on until our change comes. So, in order to encourage us, James says, don't lose your perspective. But there's something else we can discover from our lesson. In order for us to overcome discouragement in our lives, we must not only be determined not to lose our perspective, but we can also discover from our lesson that in order for us to overcome discouragement in our lives, we must be determined to stay encouraged. In verse 9 of our lesson, James reveals to us another reason why so many of us get discouraged in our time of trouble. In verse 9, James reveals to us the fact that far too many of us get discouraged because we are carrying around baggage and we are surrounded by negative people. Verse 9 of our lesson declares, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. The truth of the matter is when we surround ourselves with people who are always negative, always grumbling, always mumbling, and who are intent on keeping up nonsense and foolishness, we are actually bringing the judgment of God into our own lives. In addition to bringing the judgment of God in our own lives, people who are filled with negativity offer nothing but excess baggage. I don't know about anybody else, but I get tired of talking to folks who never have anything good to say. Tired of talking to folks who never have anything positive and anything constructive to say or to offer. In actuality, this kind of person does nothing but weigh us down and bog us down and make us cherish our spirits as well. This is why the word of God admonishes us to throw up everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Excess weight serves to hinder our progression. It limits our advancement and it impedes our momentum. Weights are encumbrances, stuff, excess baggage that can slow us down and keep us from doing our best in life. Baggage are things that rob us of our confidence, sap us of our strength. Make us doubt, keep us worried, and steal our joy. Sometimes baggage comes in the form of a person who constantly 
constantly reminds us that things of the things that God has forgotten, Christ has died for, and the Holy Spirit has already set us free from. One of the greatest weapons that the devil has is raising up people, misguided people, hard-hearted people, evil people, wicked people, who every time the Lord tries to move us or to elevate us, they come along accusing us of things that we did last month, last year, ten years ago, or somewhere else in our past. Nevertheless, I stop by to remind somebody that the devil is still alive. The devil is known as the accuser of the brethren because it is his job to accuse the people of God in order to cause us to lose our patience, lose our way, and to lose our focus. Sometimes baggage comes in the form of trials, tribulations, hardships, headaches, heartaches, setbacks, and frustrations that seem to constantly pull us down. Sometimes we can do one thing only to be confronted by two other things. Sometimes it can be so bad until we can sit and wonder in our hearts and our minds what else could possibly come next. However, there is a flip side to suffering. From God's perspective, we can rejoice in suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. Then there is the matter of sin. Sin also serves as a baggage in our lives. The truth of the matter is, some of us are our own worst enemy. Sometimes we need to check ourselves because our biggest problem may not be with somebody else, may not be with our circumstances, but it may be with us. Sometimes it's our attitude, sometimes it's our disposition, sometimes it's our mindset that needs to be checked. of someone who always has problems but never has any solutions. Problem blindness and fault blindness may indicate that we cannot find the solution because we cannot see the problem correctly. Moreover, the reason why we cannot see the problem is because we are the problem. Sometimes we need an attitude check, an attitude check. Instead of possessing an attitude of gratitude in our lives for all that God has done, some of us have nasty attitudes, mean attitudes, ungrateful attitudes, spiteful attitudes, arrogant attitudes. You name it, some of us have an attitude to go along with it. So many disciples of the church today want flourishing, prosperous, bloom, bloom, blooming, thriving fellowships, but very few us are willing to ask ourselves the question, what have I done to add or to advance the kingdom of God? Weights not only keep us down, but weights keep other folks down in the way. When we place burdens on others who are already burdened, this discourages those who are weak in the faith, and in some instances, this causes them to even leave the fellowship. God's people are some of the most less people in the world, and yet some of us cannot find a reason to do anything else in our lives but to play, nitpick, fuss, cuss, and fight. However, when you know Jesus, when you know how much God has done for you,
to stay encouraged. But in the midst of our discouragement and discouragement, in order to overcome encouragement in our lives, we must be determined to keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Verse 11 of our lesson, James uses the life of Job in order to signify the fact that if we persevere and if we keep our hope in God and not in our circumstances, and not in our abilities, and not in the abilities of others, God will bless us. In verse 11, James states, as you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought up now. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The truth of the matter, what James is saying is that Job made it. He made it even though he was rejected by his friends. He made it even though he was rejected by his wife. He made it even though he was rejected by his friends. He made it even though his circumstances were adverse. He made it even though he lost his children. He made it even though because even though he lost his wealth. He made it even though he was at the verge of losing his sanity. But the reason why he made it was because he refused to take his eyes off of his own. We are always challenged to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Tragically, far too many of us fix our eyes on all kinds of people and on all kinds of events, other than keeping our eyes on Jesus. We set our eyes on people who are leaving the church. We set our eyes on folks who have fallen out with the pastor. We set our eyes on the church leaders who lead by word but have no deeds to back up their words. We take advice from folks who are not qualified. We follow folks who are sitting down in ministries where they once served. We follow unstable folk who go from church to church because they refuse to commit themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We follow folk who hang up their robes and turn in their badges, give back their keys, resign their positions, deny their callings and forsake their destinies. And in actuality, what we are demonstrating is that we have a propensity of falling victim to the blind, leading the blind. Nevertheless, I stop by with good news this morning. Jesus still triumphantly declares, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. No one goes to the Father except to me. What we need is to be here this morning with a great resolve and a great determination to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and only on Jesus. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will be able to enter into some of the most unlikely, some of the most unstable, some of the most unpredictable, some of the most volatile, and in some instances, even some of the most ungodly circumstances with the utmost confidence because those who fix our eyes on Jesus are willing to walk 